So good afternoon, everybody. We are continuing the Budapest lecture series today, uh, the Matthias Corvinus Collegium, and it gives me a great pleasure to welcome a uh, professor here with us uh, today. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting topic, and she's not just internationally recognized academic and great researcher. I was only able to count the books she wrote or co-authored. It, it was about 25 books, but she also have practical experiences if I remember correctly, you served as a state secretary for foreign affairs from 1997 uh, to uh, 2000. So Professor Motlari is here with us and we are going to discuss the military strategy and the security policy and what would be the future for our great continent, the European nation's military uh, strategy, and also discuss the future, of the, NAT, uh, the future of the NATO. Thank you very much again for being with us. Thank you, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, I like very much the title of this uh, auditorium. Uh, I'm a great fan of uh, Scruton's writings and uh, uh, his criticism of the zeitgeist, so to speak. So I hope we can also talk about these uh, questions that are not only security and defense, but also more, what are we defending, if anything? I also would like to encourage our students and guests after the lecture, be as engaged as possible and use the unique opportunity to ask questions. Uh, you have your code and there's a slido.com and you can ask questions and hopefully I will be able to read it in my iPad, and I'll be able to convey to the professor. Okay, thank you. And I might be able to answer. Oh, some, I'm sure some. you will. <laughs> so let's start, shall we? Uh, I will start a bit uh, a provocative question, which is quite comprehensive as well. What is military strategy today in an era when European states seek to de-escalate and avoid military armed conflict? Yeah, that's, uh, I was going to say, a very good question. It is, obviously. Um, and we wrote this book, I edited this book with my colleague in Oxford, Rob Johnson, last year about uh, what we call missing in action. Strategy is, is missing in action. Uh, Europe doesn't, European states, with uh, basically two exceptions, do not have strategies. And military strategy is really uh, what one can achieve, if anything, with the use of military force. So first you need a political strategy, then you ask yourself, do I need military means to achieve it? If so, can they achieve it? So this is... Uh, uh, there are two countries that are explicitly strategic in the foreign policy that have national strategies. Um, that is, of course, Great Britain and France, the two key um, actors in Europe in this field. Uh, Germany has opted out completely of the strategic business. One could say they used up their military strategy in World War II to no avail, but I mean, they had, they had far too much of it at some point. Uh, and ever since, the Germans have excused themselves from taking strategic responsibility in foreign policy. And they certainly do not want to touch military uh, force as a means of state policy. Uh, and then there are other states with a strategic culture, smaller ones, Poland is one, Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, uh, the Balts, <coughs> states that are naturally concerned about this because they have strategic challenges in their neighborhood, Russia primarily. Uh, so uh, I would say what you find of strategic thinking in Europe goes on in some few capitals. And typically uh, the Northern Euro European countries, they uh, converge around Britain as the leader. There's even a 
an intervention brigade called the JEF, Joint Expeditionary Force, which is led by Britain, has all the North European countries as members, and around France regarding terrorism, migration, the nexus of these two in the Sahel in particular. Uh, but then NATO as an organization has a large military apparatus officers in Mons that are all experts in military planning, of course. So that's military strategy for you. The EU has virtually nothing by way of any strategic thinking, uh, although uh, sometimes we hear about strategy from the EU Commission, and that is usually synonymous with policy only. So I would say strategy, if we start, with, if we keep this term in mind, which I think is so important when we talk about, for instance, what goes on on the Polish border right now, we need to think strategically to understand it. Uh, strategy, I think, is what Mike Tyson uh, pointed to uh, when he said, um, uh, when, when, I, when I get punched in the face, um, then I need strategy, not only a plan. So if somebody does something to you that you don't expect, uh, or maybe expect but don't like, then you need strategy. So strategy is about the interaction with enemy adversary competitor. Uh, it's about being able to think, what does my competitor try to do? How can I anticipate it? Maybe I will do the opposite, paradoxical strategy, but it's the constant interaction with those who do not share your will. Clausewitz, uh, Karl von the old Prussian, he said it's about uh, strange, it's about uh, imposing our will or changing the will of the enemy. So that's different from plan, and I think Europeans have had a long period of deep peace, 1990 onwards, where one didn't have to think about adversaries, competitors, or enemies. And enemy, of course, is a term that is utterly politically incorrect. Thank you. Uh, previously, I just mentioned before we started, I had a privilege to listen a few podcasts you were participating. And one of my favorite uh, examples was when you mentioned we've been free riding, I mean, Europeans, we call it in Hungarian free lunch. And you mentioned because uh, I remember President Trump was uh, criticized in so many ways, but of course, he was probably the first uh, US president recently who was honestly very critical and very straightforward towards the alliance, towards the NATO. And he also said that almost 80%, we may uh, discuss it 77 or 75% of the budget of the contribution provided by the United States. And you mentioned in a podcast that uh, the European states are free riding. How can we accept our partners, the other side of the Atlantic, to save us, to save our borders, and to save our societies? Mm -hmm. So how do you see now the role of the United States in the European politics and also uh, in military? Yeah, I think the US, um, I, I have a column in the main financial paper of Norway, and this Monday, Monday this week, I wrote about the weak, the weak President Biden, how weak Biden is. Uh, Trump was a big problem in many ways, um, and everybody wrote about it constantly. Then came Biden, and he was supposed to be the savior. We are back, uh, you, we are back to in multilateralism and all that. Uh, and it's true that, uh, in a way, they are, they are saying the right things to the Europeans, but uh, there is no major difference here in terms of expectation, and there is no major difference in the internal problems of the U.S., which is deep polarization between the identity politics of the radical left of the Democratic Party and the... Uh, Republican, the large major majority of voters who support uh, the Republicans for the same reasons, that they disagree completely with this kind of radical agenda. So the U.S. continues to be very weak because it is so 
split over this, these issues, uh, and at the same time, um, uh, the, the demands on the expectations on the Europeans will be the same. And the Europeans uh, tend to, we tend to, ha we have this almost uh, childish expectation that the US will always do the policeman work of the world. Uh, but Biden uh, had, a, had a speech after this very uh, mismanaged exit from Afghanistan where he said that we are not going to be the policemen doing this anymore. So there's a sort of continuous line of realist thinking as one could expect, not surprising, in US foreign policy, they are not engaging for the sake of, of uh, doing our work for us. They are engaging in their own, on their own terms, as any country in a way should. So there is not uh, an, um, uh, the Europeans cannot relax and think that the Americans are now going back to some kind of uh, world policeman role. On the contrary, Europe has to manage its own problems largely on its own. And I notice that the ones that have alerted now uh, European governments, capitals, in capitals now, to this last two days, um, on the Ukraine massing of, of so Russian forces on the Ukraine border again, are again the Americans. It's the CIA that says here is intelligence, this, uh, you know, what's your response to this? Uh, and the ones that are most sort of active in responding are the British. Uh, and they are now outside the EU. So one point is that it's European capitals where decisions are important. It's not in Brussels, it's not in the EU, it's not in NATO at 30, it is in capitals. And uh, uh, this is even more true now than that Britain has left the EU, that uh, it is Washington, London, maybe Washington, Paris, although they have had a, you know, problems lately. Uh, and uh, there is no common, there's no European actor or common European response. But I'm afraid that the, in a way the, uh, I wrote a book called Hard Power in Hard Times um, about the response after Crimea. And it was the Americans that did the responding, telling Europe what to do. Uh, and now with uh, Pol the Polish crisis, there is more of a quick support for Poland there is a, re a response in Europe, uh, but uh, we have to look for individual countries, Britain former, first and foremost, then also France chipping in at this time. Ravi, you raised very, very interesting points and very crucial ones. I also would like to inform our great audience that uh, Professor Matlari, what a beautiful surname, by the way, it's Hungarian name, Matlari, if I share. Yes, Your husband yes. is a great Hungarian gentleman who is with us there. Hello, good evening. You are Kivanok. So you are also a great friend of Hungary, of course. Uh, so, actually, Professor Matlari books are also available in Hungarian, but I encourage you to read it in English, but we can also buy it in, in Hungary a few books. Anyway, let's uh, back to our uh, conversation. There is a national politics, national self-interest, and also member of the alliance. We have responsibilities, we always made commitments. One of the most popular probably towards the budget, which is the two per, to reach the two person uh, uh, compared to the GDP, per, per GDP in the uh, budget. And also just in terms of the budget, the members are facing serious challenging. As a Hungarian, I'm very proud. Uh, I remember in 2015, we have 0.5% and hopefully two years later, we will reach the 2%. So actually our uh, budget will be higher compared to our GDP than Germany, which is extremely, I wouldn't say interesting, I might say scary or odd, yeah. and I just heard that even the German government explicitly said that 1.5% will be the maximum. So this is really challenging area right now, and of course there is also national interest, meet 
the requirements of the public opinion, and especially in Germany. They don't want to increase the budget for defense. Yeah, I mean, you can find the polls. Uh, I think it's Pew uh, that has a poll on, uh, on defending uh, Europe. Are you, are you willing to defend European borders if you're a NATO member? Um, are you willing to defend uh, other NATO members if they're attacked? And the, the response rate in, hung, in, in um, Italy and Germany was very low, you know, f less, much less than 50% uh, were willing to defend other countries. So the, the, milit the sort of obligation of NATO was rejected. While people in Germany said that the Americans should do it. So, I mean, a big majority said the Americans should defend these other people, these other countries. So clearly, the, uh, in Germany, with the new socialist, uh, or at least uh, probably socialist um, dominance of the government, there will be even less willingness Absolutely. to, to uh, pay for defense or to, uh, to do the, the sort of job in NATO. Uh, and of course, that, is, uh, that underlines the trend towards coalitions of the willing and able being what we think about as NATO. And I like to put it like this. Article 5, this famous Article 5, uh, is there and is very valuable to all 30 members. Everybody wants this. You could say it's a free insurance, almost free insurance. So, so that will be, and that's also in the American interest to have this wonderful Article 5, which has, uh, you know, this is what Russia fears Therefore, Russia will not challenge Article 5. It won't invade another country, nor will any other country. I mean, you don't want the US war machine against you. So you avoid the ceiling. But uh, everything that happens is below Article 5. So we deter Article 5 from happening. NATO has done so since 1949, when it was founded. Uh, we still do it, and it's in a way a success, although we can't measure whether it really deters or not, but nothing has happened, so let's assume causality. Then, uh, the reality of everyday security policy, what we call political warfare, what goes on in Poland right now, this is below Article 5, it is on the threshold of using for military force, it is still deniable, it is presenting itself as something else, cyber attacks, hybrid attacks, subversion, um, propaganda, all the old tricks of the trade, uh, at, sometimes with the use of force. A land grab, uh, for instance, in Ukraine, is not in order to possess a part of Ukraine. It's not for the territory itself. It's for the political value of the negotiating card you acquire. Uh, we have a daughter, I've, we have four children, they're all very fond of being Hungarian, and one is more Hungarian in temperament than, than, than the others, uh, Zsófika. And she was always extremely forward-leaning as a child. She still is, but now I don't have to you know, sort of take care of her. But she said, give me an ice cream now, an ice cream now, uh, and I will not scream. You know, give me, the, give me an ice cream and I will refrain from screaming. This is maximalist negotiation. T I take a land, piece of land from your country and if you shut up and do as I say, I will do no, do no more, maybe give it back to you. So you see, this is, uh, this is political warfare as we see from Lukashenko, you know, absolutely without any inhibitions in, in the open. He ships people into a border and tries to get into another country using these poor people as, as weapons. Uh, and then we are supposed to, in a way, say, this is so horrible, we'll do anything for you to stop. So what NATO countries will be doing is uh, reacting to handling these kinds of situations, uh, which we call political warfare. It's a term from George Cannon. Uh, and this is what NATO will not be tackling uh, as an Article 5. This is something each country, in collaboration with other countries that are willing to, 
to take risk and be assertive. Uh, countries in the national capitals is where the political will is. It's not, in a way, NATO will continue, but it will be more and more a platform for coalitions like this. You mentioned you do Teju because so I have to again leave the challenging topic. And, and your pronunciation was outstanding. So I also have to inform our great audience that which I'm very proud that last year, 22nd of October, you were awarded the Knights Cross of the or the Knights Cross Order of the Merit of Hungary from the President of Hungary. So this is also very unique and congratulations and we are also very, very proud of you. So back to our challenges. You also used the term before I remember the cheap insurance. <laughs> and, and integration is always a key part of your work and, and the challenge is the lack of integration. So how can we trust each other, the members of the Alliance? How can we integrate our capabilities, how can we save ourselves together, how can we fight together. In a very uh, simple example, can we, let's say, use a common fund, a common budget to gain uh, buying power when we are actually purchasing equipment. So as soon as we find a better coalition between among the members, we would be more effective. Yeah, I mean, this, is, is, your... this is the interesting question because uh, the French uh, Revue Stratégique uh, says, we can co cooperate with other countries in these and these and these capacities, but not where it touches national sovereignty at the core, namely nuclear weapons. We can collaborate with the, with the British on nuclear weapons to some extent, that is some maintenance, some uh, teaching, some sort of non-combat things. Then they say we can uh, collaborate with like-minded countries, uh, able and willing, and that's a term from America, but it's a term that the French also use. It's the criterion of integrating with those that are willing to take risk in combat and that excludes a lot of countries that are not, I mean, Germany, for instance, are not willing to fight shoulder to shoulder with French soldiers in Africa. So there's no point in integrating much then. So uh, the French have thought through this, where does sovereignty demand that we own capacities alone? And where can we share capacities? Uh, and I think for a lot of capacities, the cost sharing is really important. It, it's pressing on every economy, so why not share cost? And we have here in Hungary, the, in Papa, I think, the, yes. the planes that uh, Norway <laughs> owns some of the transport planes and other countries. Uh, so that's for many capacities one can share a lot, uh, but uh, for some that are essentially sort of essential to national sovereignty, there has to be you have to, ha I mean, we have to have some planes in Norway, F-35s we buy. They just have to be on Norwegian territory in case of, you know, you just can't put them all, let's say, in Britain. So uh, you, can't, you can't sort of save too much by integrating fully. Uh, and also the use of, na of, of national capacities is really it's poly highly political. Do we share um, the strategic sort of uh, threat as risk and threat assessment? So we see that countries that are very close in strategic assessment, they integrate militarily and they buy the same equipment in order to be very well integrated. For instance, uh, F-35s, which you know the US will share uh, technology down to a certain point, but not below. And the fact that the US will share nuclear submarine uh, technology with Australia is a big step for the US to do that. So the, the, uh, there are limitations to what you can save in terms of money. And this is where I think the EU 
has one important role in this, and that's PESCO, a fund to share some, uh, some, some of this, giving money to those who share. But the EU can never sort of go be above a certain level of military integration because it, it, there is no strategic direction uh, to it. It will, uh, there will always, uh, it's like intelligence sharing, uh, which countries uh, trust each other, Britain and the US, the US, Britain and Australia, also New Zealand at least so far. So they are close together, um, but there is no intelligence service in the EU uh, none in the none in in the UN because one simply doesn't. It's on a need to know basis and in a, in a trust basis, and much of that logic also must apply to military equipment. Is it also because uh, right now we are facing so many challenges in the European Union, as we all know, Norway is not part of the European Union. If I may quote you, a passive member of the European passive. Union. We're passive members, passive member. like a colony under Brussels. <laughs> Indeed. So we have, we have very diverse economic levels among us in the European Union, and now we are quite diverse also uh, from the political point of view. Mm -hmm. And when we analyze the potential risk and threat, it's also quite diverse. Let's just say, for instance, uh, in South, uh, probably the most crucial challenge, threat, or risk is the illegal migration. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, our Nordic partners are very concerned about the potential threat from Russia, especially uh, since the escalation between Ukraine and Russia. So also, the, the threats and the risk are divers. So how can yeah. we find a really common goal? Yeah. How can we establish a platform when we can work together? Well, for NATO's, uh, regarding NATO, that's, the, that's the, the reality. There is no common strategic vision. Uh, and we could say almost luckily so in the sense that the Cold War was all about one scenario, <coughs> invasion from the East. Uh, so that's not a, a threat or risk anymore to the whole of, the, of, of NATO. But that's why NATO has this, uh, it's going to make it a new strategic concept, as it's called, uh, this coming year. And that will be uh, sort of northern, northern European countries concerned about Russia. Uh, but we should also be very concerned about... Uh, illegal mass migration organized from the Maghreb combined with ISIL recruitment in the area. So, I mean, it, it, it concerns us, uh, all of us, this problem. It's not, uh, and it's in a way, I think, with Russia, one can deal with a, a rational state actor. With uh, these, uh, these other groups, it's, uh, it, it's non-state groups. Uh, and... Uh, uh, the, the, so there's undoubtedly a common European or Western concern about this. Uh, so NATO and NATO now will also have to say something about China as a challenge, uh, which is something new to to NATO's agenda. So it will be, I think, continue as before with a, it's a risk and threat picture that is not unifying in, into one uh, challenge. Uh, but clearly, the, the old-fashioned military need for deterrence is there, and that is basically deterring Russia. And then uh, there has to be, I think, what we write in this book, my colleague Rob Johnson has an excellent analysis of political warfare, as I've mentioned several times. And he says we have five uh, types of state interaction today, and we Europeans are used to only one of them. We have five C's. Cooperation. Everybody likes that. Everybody's used to that. That's the normal diplomacy. Then we have competition. Well, we can handle that too. We compete. Europe competes with the US economically. Competition among countries for influence is also normal. 
But then it gets very difficult for Europeans, at least for most of us, because the next C is uh, uh, confrontation. We don't like that at all. We're not used to it. So now Lukashenko confronts Poland uh, directly. It's a full confrontation. It's, you know, I stand here and you stand there and we are maybe going into a conflict. Who knows? We are at least confronting each other. So the EU certainly is not used to this, doesn't know what to do apart from saying sanctions and more sanctions. Uh, and everybody is now trying to figure out what to do while Poland is uh, rightfully defending its border with tear gas, with water cannon, with uh, leaflets or whatever. SMSs today, not the leaflets. So this is traditional police methods for stopping a mob or stopping a riot, an entirely legitimate means uh, to use against civilians. But should there be um, a military, should Lukashenko send in some soldiers trying to cut the border fence, it would be a military attack on Poland and they would be entitled to use military force. That would be a conflict. And then there is coercion, the, the other C, the fifth C, which is to put pressure on countries. Lukashenko says, we can cut the gas to Europe. That is putting pressure on. So what uh, Rob writes in his chapter is that Europe must become much more agile and able to deal with all the five Cs, not only the cooperation and the competition one. And I, I think this is uh, really what's going on, that uh, you know, if you defend your border and you don't let thugs in, then um, the thugs will go away. But if you don't defend your border and let them in, then there will be new coming and coming and coming uh, until your country is destabilized. So this is the, uh, in a way, Europeans must think we must have red lines, we defend our sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we can even send uh, some messages about uh, our red lines, we should. And we need desperately a strategy for what we want. And that's where you know, defending Polish border or any border in Europe in a NATO country is a foregone thing. It must happen. And if you don't have a border fence, you have to build one if you need one. But what to do about, let's say, U Ukraine is much more difficult. There's no European strategy. Is it okay that it's a buffer state of Russia? Well, European political rhetoric says no. It's a democracy, it is a potential, can't get, get into, it's a candidate for the EU and for NATO. Um, it has its own sovereignty, must respect it. All the political rhetoric says this is a fully independent country. Well then, what do you do if you're challenged um, to put action to those words? That's the extreme dilemma right now, and I think that's the what the dilemma that Putin wants to sort of uh, bring up on the agenda, saying, what are you going to do then? Will you split on what to do? Will you do nothing? Must be interesting to see what you plan to do. So that's where one, plan one must have some, you know, if you have a strategy, all generals will tell you, it will never work like that, you know. But to have thought through your strategy is the valuable thing, because then you adjust, adjust to some kind of blueprint in your head. But if you have not thought about issues, you are taken completely unawares. Our favorite used to be only the 2C, the MCC, but now we really focus on the 5C. <laughs> you have to so have bear in mind that 5C, <laughs> MCC plus 3, okay? Yeah. And, and, we, and we get the 5C. Uh, it's been a very unfortunate event, and it's still diplomatic to say that unfortunate. We can call it exit or a fiasco <laughs> when uh, recently NATO uh, exit Afghanistan. And during the pandemic, and in, in a different topic, and if hopefully it will be soon, the post-pandemic era, I was always asked by my 
France, international and Hungarians. Do you think, Raymond, the new world order will change? So actually my question is, uh, it's not just because of the, the very controversial, let's say, controversial exit from Afghanistan. Can the West uh, play still the leading role in terms of security policy or, and military? Or it's... Yeah, I think the... Or it's been replaced, if I may... Yeah, the, I understand, yes, that's the, that's the, the key issue. Afghanistan, you know, was inevitable uh, because, uh, you know, we... Or let's, let me illustrate it by saying that uh, the, um, uh, the British uh, Chief of Defence, General Richard, the former Chief of Defence, he said, oh, we have to be there at least 40 years at least 40 years, whereupon Gordon Brown, then Prime Minister, said, the generals may think so, but we are not going to be there, you know, one minute more than necessary, and certainly not 40 years. And the idea that you can change a society from the outside, uh, sort of nation building, that requires almost that you're a colonialist, because you have to stay there for so long, and you have to sort of impose your will uh, for a long time. Now, uh, NATO was not going to do that. It was, it was just a, a crazy idea that you could change Afghanistan. We have a son who's a, an officer and he was a combat soldier there and he was in 16 fights or battles with the Taliban. Each time they could sort of fight them out of an area, but then the civilian goals or civilian actors were supposed to come in to that area and, uh, and develop it. Did they come? No, because they were too afraid to be there. So, I mean, it, it, was, it was impossible. But uh, I think that the, the question you ask is really, will the West only defend its borders and itself, or will the West try to spread democracy? Will we try to expand the EU and NATO to the Balkan states, to, the, to Ukraine, to Georgia, uh, to Moldova? Will we try to you know, have an open door policy? NATO has managed to expand to two countries in the Balkans uh, in recent years. One is impossible to remember. It's named, it's called North Macedonia and it's Macedonia, but you're not allowed to say Macedonia because the Greeks get angry <laughs> because they have, they have a claim on the name Macedonia too. So it's, was co it was called Phyram, which is even worse than North Macedonia. But it's North Macedonia and it's Montenegro. And Bosnia, where I worked a lot when I was in politics, <coughs> is a, you know, a candidate for membership. So I think uh, NATO in a way, <clears throat> a test will be if we are just, we can't be realists in that old-fashioned type saying, okay, you're a dictatorship, that's fine, you, that's how you live, and we're a liberal democracy, so we are dem Democrats, we live another, in another way. We respect you and you respect us. Power is what counts. We will not try to influence you. Uh, I think uh, the West has to continue to try to have an open door policy and to influence with democratic norms. Uh, but it's going to be much harder now than it was in 1990. Uh, and that's why the Ukraine question is a, a test of this. Because if, if we, should, let's think that uh, in a way, uh, we, we cannot say anything about Ukraine because we don't know what we think what we want. We would like it to be sort of a democracy moving in our direction, but we don't want to take any risk to make it become one. So in a way, we can say rhetorically that uh, you are free and independent and absolutely uh, can join us if you want. Uh, but if that is tested militarily, we are probably just going to watch it, not do anything. And you could say it would be an extreme risk to try to do something. So this is where realpolitik meets idealism, so to speak. 
Why is it that the military risk and the military strategy is not the not the first two or first three priority for politicians? Yeah. I mean, like, what can yeah. be more important than your country's sovereignty and to save the people, to save yeah. the society and ensure the trust and the stability? Yeah, that's, uh, that's of course, again, a very good question. And uh, the answer is, of course, is, uh, is not of course, but the answer is, unfortunately, that politicians are never elected on these issues. They are, we had national elections uh, in September and defense and security was the lowest in the Gallup on the agenda. 6% were interested in that. And we are neighbors of Russia, and we sort of have all this habitual talk about Russia sort of being aggressive in exercises and incursions in airspace and all that. So I think it is uh, people's heads, in a way, are uh, people, you young people, you were born after 1990, so um, you have always had this deep peace uh, in your lives, and my students as well. Uh, they have no feeling of the Cold War, of in insecurity, of repression. Uh, the world seems to be a, a big globalia, the global village where you can move around and have fun. Uh, so it is, unfortunately, sort of, you learn the hard way. When something happens, it's too late to start building up your military. And that's why the military seems like a tremendously expensive insurance policy. Uh, yet, uh, no countries have dared to abandon it, not to pay it. I mean, Iceland is the only country without any kind of military uh, ability in Europe. Uh, and also Liechtenstein, of course, these mini, mini states. But, uh, but the others, even Switzerland, which is neutral, has a large number of tanks and soldiers. So it's a paradox. I think the, uh, maybe it's the press, uh, you know, maybe it's, it's so unpleasant to talk about these stark realities and dark themes. Uh, it's, risk is something most people avoid if they can avoid it. And politicians, I think, are very happy if they can avoid all sorts of risk. So we, f we lack statesmen and stateswomen. We have lots of politicians that are more interested in re-election than in, in national, national politics. I used to work and live in Singapore, and my Singaporean <coughs> friends always say that being in a safe place is the, 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 the best luxury you can get. So, of course... Uh, uh, the, the new generation enjoy the luxury, and yeah. we do. But it also reminds me of some situation because the very wealthy transnational companies or governments are aware of the risk of cyber security or cyber attacks, and the smallest department usually uh, working with some IT guys. But when something happens, yeah. there is a crisis. And we shouldn't wait for something happens. I don't want any wake-up call in our great continent in Europe in order to understand the importance to avoid the unforeseen consequences of the real threat. Yeah, I think this is why every country now has uh, cyber defenses that have... To, there are, I mean, every day there are attacks on your ministries, on your on your defense force, on your companies, many from hackers, but many from uh, especially three countries that are always named by the security services, in, uh, in Norway at least, it's Russia, it's China, it's Iran. Uh, a lot of <coughs> hybrid attacks that are, of course, testing, but also destroying and so on. So cyber defense uh, is now a, a major cyber attack has now been included in a, the Article 5 of NATO as a national attack. And Estonia was experiencing that in 2007. Uh, you know, if you have, may, suddenly you may have strange news <laughs> on the national television, you have no 
uh, network, uh, your bank money is gone, um, maybe electricity system is breaking down, there's a sabotage going on uh, somewhere. You know, we had a TV series called Occupied, which is quite good about this. It's not clear, you know, it's not from peace to war. It's not the old fashioned sort of from uh, normality to a war situation. It's much more unclear. It's deniable. It is chaotic. What's happening? This kind of situation. And, and that is uh, uh, that is what we call political warfare. That's the reality. And, and uh, when we see just businesses that are extorted for money and how much damage you can do in the, in the cyberspace, it's just appalling. So I think we, we are very vulnerable the more we are internet, uh, sort of uh, everything is, is dependent on electronics. So we have to think about this kind of, of uh, vulnerability uh, as, as a problem also. Uh, and, and I think we, you know, people who work on this always say, you are at war already, you just don't know it. And that sounds alarming, and it is. Uh, but there's some, something to this. I mean, you probably get a lot of swindle attacks on your emails, <laughs> on your phones. I get a lot, you know, from offers of various things. Just push that or go into that link and you will, we will verify your, your, your bank uh, account numbers or whatever. All swindle, all the time. Uh, but there are more subtle attempts, you know, that, that can be extremely damaging. So to, for citizens to be um, vigilant, to be, um, not to be naive, to be resolute, all of that uh, is becoming more important. It's like, it's like an old-fashioned virtue that is coming back. Uh, you as citizens, you are more than just individual, private persons. You have uh, a country to defend. You have to be aware of, of attacks uh, of new kinds. On a personal note, actually, I love the series Occupied. Uh, you can also practice the language and also, of course, with English or Hungarian subtitle because it's in Norwegian, the yeah. occupied. And the Russian occupies and the Norwegian prime minister try to save the country. I watch all the parts, not because of you. I didn't know we are going to talk about it. But it's a great show anyway. Okay. Uh, can we ask our dear students to provide a question, if they already uh, provided? Did you use the, the app and the code, please? Yes, yes, we have questions on the Okay, cool. Then ask me the code, and then you can ask me if you have a question. Maybe we have been attacked here, so... Oh, no, <laughs> the questions have been... I've been stolen. Yes, 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 we have questions. We don't usually uh, meet with an internationally recognized author and academic and also a deputy minister, so use the opportunity, the unique opportunity to ask questions. Not about the lottery numbers in Saturday because we have no clue. So, provocation, anonymous. If we, Europe, don't have an atomic bomb, all money poured into military forces is wasted as, as we will never play with the big guys. Okay. No, I think it's, uh, what, I don't know what really the meaning of the big guys will be. Oh, me neither. The Americans, maybe. But uh, there are two, two nuclear forces uh, or countries in Europe, as you probably know, France and, and Great Britain. Uh, and their nuclear, uh, their nuclear weapons are uh, most certainly in submarines that are rotating at sea. Uh, all the time, very few people know where they are, and that's the whole point of deterrence. So there is a nuclear deterrent in Europe, uh, and, uh, but, but the real action, hopefully, will never touch on nuclear 
weapons or on uh, conventional war, old-fashioned war. Uh, what we see, as I like to repeat, is this incessant small kind of uh, limited attacks, sometimes involving military force, but the uh, go sort of beyond competition to confrontation, to coercion. This is where the action is, uh, using this example of Poland as one of them. Uh, and this is where Europeans have to deal with this themselves, basically in national capitals. So if you are, you, your border is attacked in the same way as the Polish, you will probably have help from, uh, from the Poles, from the neighbors, maybe from the, uh, the um, NATO headquarters, but it's not strictly a NATO business unless there's a, a real sort of invasion of, 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 a, of a magnitude. So that's, what, that's my message, is that international politics, also here in peaceful Europe, is now much more of this um, from competition to confrontation kind, instead of just cooperation. And therefore, states will need um, to spend on defense, but they will also need to, to have a, a strategic foreign policy. And usually, we, we do not use military force for, for very much, uh, but it is usually a deterrent, you know, to keep it from being used. We use it to, to signal politically, we have it and we will defend ourselves. Therefore, don't try anything. But all these other forms of coercion, confrontation, and all that requires strategy and then maybe some hard power from time to time. So the need security policy is now much more important in Europe than it has been uh, for a long time. And we start this period we're in almost around, two, we, we started usually with the Russian occupation of two enclaves in Georgia. 2008, that was a signal to NATO, don't include Georgia in NATO. And then we had Crimea, and then we have a lot of competition and uh, confrontation um, with, uh, in, in also Europe. So we have, left, we have left this deep peace of the 90s, and that's, I think, definite now. But it's hard to wire one's mind to... Uh, to these uh, major shifts, of course. Just a personal comment. I do not believe that we Hungarians want to be always the pioneer or the frontiers, especially delivering the potential threats. But it happened again in 2015. I believe we, hung we Hungarians, especially our Prime Minister Viktor Orban, explicitly raise the awareness of the disaster, what could happen. It was six years ago, uh, and when we build a fence to actually not just save the Hungarian society, the Hungarian borders, but also the Schengen zone and our European friends, and now a few other countries already making the same approach or try to somehow save the borders against illegal immigration. Sometimes being first doesn't really help, but now, of course, they understand. We are yeah. not going to apologize for sure. But anyway. Now, can I just comment sure, on that? Sure, sure, please. Because this is, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the whole sort of moral shaming uh, campaign that went on at the time. Um, well, it was overwhelming. And in Norway, we also have this uh, tremendous sort of humanitarian NGOs and lawyers that, uh, let's say, you, everybody who comes must be allowed to apply for political asylum on the border, which is, of course, the incentive for coming in the first place. And now Lukashenko has, in a way, um, done, a, done a favor for, in, the, in the interest of political clarity, because now we have no NGOs, no EU commissioners, no... Uh, lawyers saying, but all those on the border with Poland must be let into Poland and, and uh, apply for political asylum in Poland for humanitarian reasons and so on. You must open the border uh, because they realize that this is a complete setup. 
where people have been transported up from Iraq to be used as pawns in a game. They realize that this is about, inter this is security policy of having to do with crashing a border. So now it is eminently clear that nobody will dominate the discourse about this like they did in 2015. Um, and country after country are now seeking asylum to take the asylum application process to some other country. Uh, and the EU itself is seeking to do that in uh, regional dis disembarkation platforms, as it's called in Africa. So uh, reality has, in a way, forced itself into this political issue. But uh, uh, it is really extremely unpleasant to be in opposition to the sort of more, the more, those who moralize about politics. And this is a very good case study of, of uh, how that more moral discourse was so dominant five years ago. And now you, in, in its meeting with reality, <coughs> there's basically nothing left of it. And just one uh, very short comment on that. Since the NATO exit from Afghanistan, we see the increasingly we see the numbers of illegal uh, immigrants increasing every single day. So this is a real uh, threat. Anyway, another question, not from me. Bence Kertész, what is the protocol in case of NATO members attack each other? For example, there's a risk for in this case of Turkey and Greece. Yeah, that's a, that's a special case. Turkey, you know, it's... Uh, it's um, uh, NATO has this, uh, these wonderful words about democracy and uh, values and being a value-based military alliance. And there we have Turkey in the midst. Uh, and <coughs> whatever sort of uh, enfant terrible Erdogan becomes, he is never threatened to be expelled from NATO because the Americans make it abundantly clear, and we all see that having Turkey inside NATO is better than having Turkey outside NATO. And uh, the geopolitical footprint of having Turkey in that region where it is, is very valuable to NATO. So um, I think this is, a, this is also, when you study power, you sometimes see these paradoxes that Erdogan is so bright that he sees that he can be so bad, such a bad guy, uh, and do almost anything, and he will not be punished. So he does sort of, he, he, he is a specialist in this kind of wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, you know, being nasty towards everybody, and cashing in a lot on the migrants. <coughs> and of course, Europe has made itself dependent on Erdogan for stopping mig migration into Europe, paying so much money to him. But he has the levers, and he has used them uh, against uh, Greece on my migration twice, trying to storm the, the Greek border. So these are nasty, nasty things. And um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's the, the bottom line here is simply that it's better to endure Erdogan. Uh, he won't last forever. Uh, it's better to keep him inside NATO um, and uh, keep him outside the EU uh, because the, the worse he gets, the less chance is there ever of admitting uh, Turkey into the EU. So that won't happen, but one keeps a sort of process going nonetheless. So it's a sort of, uh, this is realpolitik in Europe that, uh, um, you know, you can't say to a country, go away or you know, move somewhere else. <laughs> it, it is where it is. Indeed. Another question. Could you please talk a little bit more about the relationship between the EU and Russia? Yes, well, the EU and Russia, that is sanctions that continue over Crimea, renewed every six months. Uh, many EU countries would like to lift the sanctions because, of course, they are never going to result in this uh, intention, namely to sort of leave Crimea for that Russia will hand back Crimea to Ukraine. 
because Crimea as a military base, Sebastopol is far too valuable to Russia for that to happen. So the sanctions are not giving the results intended, which is usually the case with sanctions. They are an irritant, but a lot of smuggling is going through the Baltic states. So, I mean, goods are sent despite sanctions. Um, the real reason why the EU is not considering any lifting, there are two reasons. One is that right now it would be the wrong political signal. Uh, and the other one is that the Americans are uh, adamant that if we have sanctions on Russia, then you have sanctions on Russia too. So this was American uh, leadership. But it's, you know, international affairs is really kind of depressing because uh, things are not, you, you know, in medical science, there are new discoveries, vaccines and cures, and there's progress. International affairs, <coughs> it's sort of, again, the same things happen. It's sort of peace and then war and then problems. So I don't see, um, you know, I, I, when there's a military coup somewhere, uh, states will say and the UN will say, we condemn this, we will never relate to this regime. Then they say, we condemn this completely, it's unacceptable, etc. Then five years down the line, line of timeline, you just have to deal with that regime, which used to be a military dictatorship and now is more of a whatever government. So time tends to, in a way, uh, solve problems, if you will. I don't think we will have sanctions on Russia over, over Crimea for 50 years. So sometimes one says things cannot be solved, we just see how time works on this. Highly unsatisfactory answer, I guess. I'm selfish. I would love to ask so many questions, and, and we received more questions, but according to my very strict colleague, she said that we don't have time, we do not have time for more questions. So, and can I ask our uh, little group to have a group picture with us? Would it be possible? Okay. And, but, but most importantly, uh, on behalf of the Matthias Corbinus Collegium community, family, Thank you very much. Janne Halan Matlari. And don't forget. A great professor and a great friend of Hungary. Thank you very much for visiting us and see you very soon. Yeah. Viszontlátás. Köszönöm szépen. Köszönjük szépen.